my wife said to warn you, I haven't preached in six months. Um, that means either I've forgotten how to do it, or <laughs> we'll hit the gas tank and not be able to stop. Um, it's, uh, it's the last day of the year. And um, as of midnight, we start 2024. Um, I was thinking about that this week, and I was thinking about how do, how do different people kind of celebrate the new year? I came across a story, it's an old Italian story, it's supposedly in the old culture of Italy. They would have a tradition, and this was the tradition that, that you would, uh, and you got to understand, this is with cobblestones and two to three stories of streets, and they're, they're crowded together, but just before midnight on, on New Year's Eve, um, the place would go absolutely silent. No one would be outside. No one would be on, on the streets. Even the police wouldn't be, be there. The, everything would be absolutely quiet and still. And then at midnight, suddenly there would be all kinds of shouts and laughter and song and playing. And the, and the funniest part was that suddenly, all up and down the, every street, suddenly all the windows would start to open up in people's houses and fireworks would go off and people would stick their heads out and then they would start taking all the things in their house that they didn't want anymore and they'd throw it out the window. And, and so there would be dishes and pots and pans and clothes and books and old furniture and piled in the middle of the street. Someone the next day or two would start picking them up and taking them to the garbage. But the idea was you got to get rid of the old and, and start afresh in the new year. Well, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, so what, what do we do? And I, I was thinking about when I was growing up, it, it was, it was that, that whole talking about setting um, New Year's resolutions. Do you remember doing those things? It, it's like, oh, I'm going to lose some weight this year, finally, or I'm going to work out this week or year, or I'm not going to go to work as much. I'm going to stay more with the family. And, and all of, we made all these resolutions. They lasted about three weeks but we made them and then I started asking myself this weird question what do we do in our culture today and I started listening to the news and YouTube and all kinds of different people talking and the theme has shifted I don't know if you've watched that theme shift but the theme has shifted to what I would consider a negative focus people will say again and again um, 19, 2024 well it's going to be worse than it was last year you will see that headline everywhere. And I started asking myself the question, so, so what are they talking about and what issues are, are, they, are they bringing up? And, 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 I, and, and I could not believe all the things I kept hearing about. For instance, there were some that would say, well, there, there's going to be a new pandemic. And, and others would, would talk about, but the, no, they're going to they're close our bank and we're going to get rid of paper money and they're going to digital and, and it'll be controlled, our, uh, controlling our money. And others would talk about the globalism uh, w WEF or, or, or the WHO or the United Nations and, and they want to change and make this global world um, and, and it's a world that is not voted on, it's by the rich and the powerful, not by the people and, and they want to move us into, into cities, I don't know if you've heard about this and, and 15 minute cities and, and, and get rid of our I just, they want to change people are reacting, then there's the whole uh, climate hysteria, we could go forever on that one and, and there's the gridlock, the, the internet going to collapse. Have you heard, heard stories about people warning again and again about we're going to lose the internet and, and, and our, everything is going to be lost and there's unprecedented violence. Um, incredible violence. And, but even more, you'll hear in our world talk about wars and wars and wars. In the last couple of months, we've heard lots of talk about potential nuclear wars and others about we are in World War III already. And, and, and then there, there's others that are talking about civil, civil unrest and civil wars, that, talking about the American elections. That, is this going to divide and cause a... Uh, and, and you hear all of that kind of talk. There's, there's the universal basic income our prime minister wants everybody to have. And, 
and, and, and, and then there's the whole discussions of diversity, equality, and inclusion. Have you heard some of those kind of discussions? And then, and then there's food shortages. I don't know if, if you've noticed in the last well where you're doing your Christmas baking and you go to the store and there's no sugar. And, and all kinds of people are saying, well, what about this and what about that? And, 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 and then there's mass immigrations, thousands and thousands of people coming from all over the world to places they think are better. And as I was reading this and listening to this, there's this negative, fearful attitude in our world that's rising. Now, I... I, I'm, I'm a, you got to understand me. I'm a guy who's always asking questions. And so my question was, so if that's true, if, if our culture is getting more pessimistic and optimist, or, uh, instead of optimistic and, and, and fearful and, and all of those things, how, how am I supposed to respond as a Christian? Like, in this next year, what should I look forward to instead of be afraid of? This morning I want to take you to a theme uh, a passage that maybe you've heard many, many times before. A passage that maybe you've studied, but maybe you've missed a little bit of the setting or the theme that Jesus is trying to communicate. So if you have your Bibles, I would like you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. I'm going to read it. It's only 13 verses, but it, it's powerful verses. And here's what's interesting. It's a simple story, but as you dig a little bit deeper, it's a complex story. There's a lot of dynamics that you kind of sit and scratch your head and, what did Jesus mean by that or this? Listen to the word of the Lord, chapter 25 of Matthew, starting at verse 1. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps. But the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom saw was when the bridegroom was delayed, they all came, became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were aroused by the shout, "Look, the bridegroom is coming! Come out and meet him!" All the bridegroom bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, "Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out." But the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to the shop and buy some of you for yourself. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went with him to the marriage feast and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. Then he called back, believe me, I, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour of my return. Now, as we read this passage, I, I gotta give you a, a bit of background, a bit of context, so that you understand what Jesus is talking about as he's as he's talking about the various uh, things in the passage. First of all, this is a prophetic passage. What, what do I mean by that? Jesus has been with his disciples and significant things have happened. After three years of ministry, Jesus has come and proclaimed himself king. Remember him riding the colt into Jerusalem and, and all the shouts and Hosanna and all of those kind of things were going on and people were so excited uh, about him. He's finally said he's king. He's finally come public to, to all of the things and people were just ready. He walks in after that and cleanses the temple. Remember, drives out the moneylenders? And, and, and then, that's even more powerful than because he's saying he's setting this place spiritually. The kingdom of, of, of Israel, the kingdom of God is going to be advanced. As they were walking out of the temple one of those days, disciples looked around at him and said, hey, you know, isn't this an amazing place? And they looked at the, glo the gold and the, the decorations and, and all of the things of, of this temple that Herod had spent over 40 years fixing up and making beautiful. And they're saying, this is so awesome. And Jesus turns to them and said, not one rock is going to be upon another. 
This blew them away. That Jesus would predict this destruction of the temple. Now, I've been to that temple. If, if some of you have been to Israel, you will see stones that are huge, that, that are almost as big, if not as bigger, than this stage. They're massive, but not one rock was upon another. Now, that's a, that's a whole story in, in itself. But Jesus' prediction did come true. But this led the disciples on, on this passionate journey of, of saying, if he knows that, what else hasn't he told us? Lord, tell us, tell us about your return. Tell us about the end of time. And they were all excited to hear that. So Jesus takes them across the valley out of Jerusalem, away from the temple, into the garden of, of, of the, the olive grove. It's called the Olive Discourse. And, and he starts teaching them, specifically four of the disciples. And he starts telling them about prophetic things. Now, what's interesting, and, and, and I've, I've actually I've been sp taking the last couple of months just studying this, these two chapters. What's interesting is, is he tells them very specific prophetic events that are coming, but he's more concerned about their preparation or, or, or their response, their application to his teaching. So he, he will predict a bunch of things, but he will send, he'll give you nine parables or prophecies or, or teachings about how your heart and my heart should be prepared for what's coming in the future. And I think this passage also speaks to you and I and, and the preparation for these next couple, coming days. Now, I, I, need to, I need to break this down a little bit for you so that you have a sense of the culture and, and, and the, the way things work. Because this parable was, would have been a little bit shocking to the disciples. You see, you've got to understand the way a wedding was done in those days. We've just gone through the, the Christmas story and Mary and Joseph, and you remember in Matthew that the, uh, Mary and, and Joseph were engaged? Well, how did that all happen? Well, when they were little kids, and this is typical of the Jewish culture at that time, when they were little kids, the, the dad and the dad got together and said, well, you've got a daughter, I've got a son. Think they'll work together? Yeah, I think it'll be good. And the arrangement was made when they're about that high. Now, I know all the kids here really are looking forward for their parents to do that, right? And, 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 and so they arranged that marriage when they were ch young children. And, 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 and then a time would pass as they grow up. They may meet each other. They may spend time together, but not a lot of time. They just knew that they were engaged. Now, about a year before the wedding took place, they would move into what was called the betrothal. They would literally have a, have a ceremony and they would make vows to one another. Mary and Joseph would make vows to one another and, 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 and then uh, they would go apart again. Why would they go apart? Well, say Joseph was living in this, part, this place and Mary was living in this place, he would go to build a home for her. If, if, if he wanted to live near his father and say farm with his father or whatever, he would build literally a, a, an addition onto his far, father's house. If, 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 he, if he wasn't doing that, he would literally build a home. So he would go away for a year and she would go and prepare to, to be a, a, a bride, a, a wife, and a, and, and a mother. She would do all of those kind of preparations. And then at the end of the year, the wedding would take place. Now, you remember the, the Christmas story, it was, it was a legal wedding at the betrothal, not, not at the wedding date. So what would happen, and this is where this story focuses in, what would happen is as, as um, the date got closer, it would all get arranged so that the bridegroom would come. And what would happen is he would come and it would be all arranged and, and she would have bride maids. Some of your translations say virgins. What that simply meant was girls who hadn't been married yet. And, and they would be all prepared. You know, they'd get their dresses out and they'd get all of those kind of things and the banquets would be prepared and, 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 the, and the wine would be, remember Jesus at the, wine, at the wedding feast? All, all of that would be set apart. And then when it was all ready to go, the groom would send a message saying, I'm coming. And he would come, and, and he'd come with his best men and all of that. And, 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 and usually they, they would come about evening time, just about the time it was starting to get dark. 
and he would come and, and outside her home would be the bridesmaids waiting and, and they would have either torches or lamps. A lot of the Bible teachers want to say it was torches. I, I kind of like lamps better. It doesn't matter. But what would happen is the groom would come and take his bride and everybody would light these lamps or these torches and a parade would happen throughout town. And they would find the longest way throughout the town and they would celebrate and sing and everybody would follow them and they'd laugh and, and all of that. And then they'd all go together into the banquet and have a seven-day wedding. Now, if you're a parent and you've married one of your children, can you imagine seven days of a wedding? You'd be just exhausted. But that's what they do. So Jesus tells a story, and, and, and as he's telling the story, he does it different than they expected. He starts to talk about how the bridesmaids or the virgins, these, these girls who had brought, were to bring their lamps and light up the parade as, as it goes, were waiting for the groom to come. The message had gone out, and, and the, the bridegroom was coming. Now, here's what's interesting. If you were a Jew sitting there and listening to what was going on, you would have said, "What? Well, I thought this was the story about a groom and his bride. Bride isn't even mentioned. The focus is on these 10 girls. And they have come, and they're sitting outside the house, <laughs> all re ready for what's going on. They've got their lamps. Now, Jesus distinguishes these lamps. He says there's some that have come with lamps and they've brought an extra bowl of oil just in case they needed more oil. And, and you have these oil lamps and, and, and there's a wick on them and, and, and they're, they're lit and if they burn out, you just add more olive oil. But there's five who never brought extra oil. And that's the focus of the thing, the preparation for this wedding celebration. Now, remember I said this is, this is situated right in the middle of prophetic teaching. So let me sidetrack for a moment and take you to some prophetic teaching. Jesus has been talking to his disciples about leaving and then later on returning. You notice the disciples, when they talk about it, both in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, talk about the end of the age. Otherwise, they believe that this will be the end of all time, and a new kingdom, a new earth, all of that will be sent when the Messiah takes his throne, in the throne of David. And, and so, so they're, they're living in this anticipation. Now, you and I know Jesus has said very specifically, you will not know the day and the hour. But as you start to read this passage, you will see that Jesus gives us what, what I would call signs of the return. Now, even as I'm preaching this, even as I'm talking to this, let me tell you something really, really strange. 80 to 90% of churches, pastors, never talk about this talk about Although a quarter of your Bible is made up of prophetic teaching, some of it fulfilled, a lot of it still to be fulfilled, uh, they just don't, they avoid it like the plague. Well, it's too complicated, or it's too confusing, or, 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 or there's different opinions, and just avoid it like the plague. Jesus doesn't want us to avoid it. He wants us to live in this anticipation of his coming. Now, as I, as I started to read this passage in, in chapter 24, he says two really interesting, significant things. He says, first of all, that, that there will be signs. He will, he will talk about, about wars and rumors of wars. He will talk about the persecution of believers. He will talk about earthquakes and famines. He will talk about the, the gospel being preached throughout the whole world. He, he will talk about signs in the skies, sig significant cosmological signs. And he will talk about even pestilences, which I don't know if you know this, pestilence can also be translated pandemics. But this is what Jesus is saying as he's teaching them in chapter 24. You need to be aware, you need to be watching for the signs of his coming. 
He uses a picture of a fig tree. And, and all of us have seen this. You've seen your tree in the backyard that spring is around and suddenly those little buds start to come out. And Jesus, who has said, you won't know the day and the hour, implies you will know the season. Are, are you watching the signs of the season? How is our world changing and where is it moving toward? Do you see things getting worse? Is there increase of wars or rumors of wars? And, and, and so Jesus says, I want you to recognize that although you won't know the day and the hour, you will know the season of its coming. He also has an interesting comment, another picture, and, and this is the picture of labor. And, and ladies, if you've had a baby, you understand this, that, that he's talking about there's, there's, there's these, these labor pains, and some of them are quite mild. In fact, some of them, when, when it started, it's like, oh, is this a labor pain, or do I just got a bit of gas? But as it increases, and it gets worse and worse and worse and harder and harder and harder, you know the baby is coming. And Jesus says, you need to watch for the labor pains happening, things increasing in intensity. Are events in our world increasing in intensity? Now, I, I don't believe you'll know the day and the hour. But I suspect, at least in my personal point of view, that we're, and I'm quoting someone, we're in the last of the last times. Otherwise, there, there's this period of time where it, we're getting closer and closer to Jesus' return. And the question is, are we ready, ready? With that in mind, let me take you back to the story. It, it's interesting because as the story is told, something absolutely unexpected happens. Uh, now, now, I, I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm a person who functions with a clock and, and, and all of that kind of, and, and, but they didn't have clocks like we had clocks. And so the groom would send a message, let's say he's from another town saying, send a runner ahead and tell him we're coming, we should be there about dusk, and, 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 and so everybody should be ready for, for me to come. And, and so oh, everybody gets their, 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 their party stuff together, they get their lamps out, they get their olive oil out, all of that, and they go to the, the bride's house and they're waiting, expecting him. And he's gone a long time. Whether it's to delay or not, he's gone a long time. And he doesn't appear when they expect him to appear. In fact, it was so long that they fell asleep. And, and, and so as, as you start to read this story, they, they literally just kind of nodded off. Now, uh, you remember doing that? You remember? It's like you, you're all dressed up and, and, you, and you sit down and half an hour goes, an hour goes, two hours goes. It literally, they went to midnight. Which I wonder why Jesus said that. I, I wonder if it's the darkest part of the night. I wonder if that's spiritual. Are we living in dark times? So, he, he, he doesn't turn up. And, and, and it's absolutely unexpected. It's been this long time. Now, one of the reasons people don't want to talk about the second coming of Christ is they say, well, yeah, but all over the years there's been people predicting the coming of Christ and, and he's going to come now and he doesn't come and, and he's going to come now and he's not, and, and we've waited years. It's been 2,000 years. Yes, it has. It's been a long time since the bridegroom has promised to come. But his timing is perfect. I, I know a number of people, and, and, and they, they become brand new Christians, and they start to dive into, into Scripture. One of the places they all go is Revelation. Let's just jump into Revelation. Listen to this, and did you see this? And, and, and did you hear that, what Jesus said about this? And there's this beast, and all, just all this kind of, it's cool and stuff. And then they kind of get cool. It's like... Yeah, but I've been waiting. I've been waiting at least three weeks and he hasn't turned up. And they kind of fade. I want to challenge you about your anticipation, your expectation 
of Jesus' return. I want to show you something, and I've read lots of books about this kind of stuff, but I find this really fascinating. I started reading through the whole New Testament about about Jesus' second coming, and I found something really kind of fascinating that I've never seen anybody other mention. If I laid out your Bible in, in, a, in a historical line, I would start in the Old Testament, and there's all kinds of prophetic teachings in the Old Testament about not only Jesus' first coming, but Jesus' second coming. And, and the details are really specific, and, 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 and I could get into, into some of that, but, but you, will, you could go to Isaiah, you could go to Jeremiah, but probably the guy that's most fascinating is Daniel. And Daniel sets timetables. If, if you understand Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream and he sees this man, but the man's made of gold and silver and bronze and clay. And, 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 it, it, and Daniel interprets that dream and talks about the various kingdoms, the kingdom of the Babylon and then the Medes and the Persians and, and, then, the, and then the Greeks and then, and then the Romans. Daniel gives us timelines. In chapter 9, he gives a timeline of the end of time with the last period of that time being what's called the tribulation. There's other names for it, but often you'll hear us talk about it being the tribulation. So Daniel talks about it, and so there's this expectation. When you get into the New Testament, you will, you will start with the Gospels. And as you start with the Gospels, you'll find that, that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who parallel each other, will each talk about it. Matthew the most. He'll put two chapters in. Luke will, or Mark will put one chapter 13, and Luke will put one chapter 21. But they, they are the teachings of Jesus about the end of times. John doesn't repeat that, but John gives you a verse that you have probably memorized and often have not thought of it as a prophetic word. The teaching is in John chapter 14, verses 1, through three, four, through one 2, and 3, and 4. In my Father's house are many mansions. If I had not told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again to take you to be with me. And, and so there is this, this anticipation that comes out of the Gospels. Now, what do Christians do? Christians read that kind of passage. They go to the book of Acts, and chapter 1 and is the ascension, where Jesus goes and ascends into heaven. And what do the angels say? The angels say, in like manner, he will come again. And so there's this exciting anticipation of when Jesus will come. But what would we do? We jump over to Revelation. Now, Revelation is a fabulous book. Fabulous book. But I, I, I want you to notice something that I never clued into because people will jump to, from the predictions to these details. And, and as, as, you, as you get into the details, you'll, you'll be fascinated. It's symbolic language. It's pictorial language. It's predictive language. It's, it's just amazing. In fact, John says as he writes, if you read it, you will be blessed. But then I started looking at the epistles in between. Now let me show you something that I find quite amazing. Between Jesus' end of his ministry, which is about 33, to the writing of the book of Revelation, which John wrote about 95, there's over 60 years. So there's over 60 years for, for the church, the brand new church, to live in anticipation of the coming of Christ. Now watch this, this 60 years. There are phrase after phrase after phrase from the Christian writers about living in anticipation for his coming. Paul will write it in all of his letters. Hebrews will write it, James will write it, John will write it, Peter will write it, June will write it. And you think, well, oh, of course, they're all living in that anticipation. But think about this. Where do we learn about the four horsemen of the apocalypse? Revelation. So they hadn't heard about it. Where do we hear about, about the judgments, the three various judgments, the judgments of the seals, the judgment of the trumpets, the judgment of the, of the bulls of wrath? Well, we, Revelation. 
Well, where do we hear about Armageddon? Revelation. Well, where do we hear about the details of the Revelation? And so these Christians, for 60 years, would live with anticipation without knowing all of those details. They would know about a lawless one, as, as Peter says, uh, the Antichrist. They would know about the millennium because it had been talked about in the Old Testament all the way through. But all of those details that you and I assume, they didn't. They lived with just one focus. Jesus is coming again. Listen to the words. His glory is appearing. When the Lord comes, the coming of the Lord, when he appears in his coming, to see the day approaching, the end of all things is near. He is coming in the clouds, eagerly revealed, appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will appear a second time. The chief shepherd appears. The Lord is coming near. We're looking forward to the day. Ten times he, he uses that word appearing. They lived without knowing the end of time details with an anticipation that it may be today, it may be tomorrow, it may be in three months, it may be in 10 years, but he is coming again. There's a lot of Christians who don't know anything about his return. Are we living in that anticipation? Now theologians will call it the doctrine of imminence. I, I like the word expectation better, but they, they live in that. Now let's get back to the story. So get back to the story. The bridegroom suddenly appears at midnight. Those lamps have been burning for six hours, and most of those lamps are dry. Now for the six of the five of them, they have refresher oil, so they fill up their oil. And and um, and, 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 and suddenly the other five are looking at each other and saying, we don't have enough for oil, we're not ready. We're not ready for his, him to come yet. And so they turn to their friends, and you and I would have done this too, uh, can, can, can you lend us some of your oil? And, and, and the, the ones who had the oil looked at and says, no, we, we don't have enough. We will barely have enough for the parade, and then we'll be are empty too. You need to go and you need to, 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 to find some help and you need to find someone who will give you some oil and then come back and join us as quick as you can. And so five of these girls leave. Now, Jesus calls them foolish. We'll get to that in a sec. He calls them foolish. So they take off. And, and just after they take off, the groom appears with his bride, his, his, his men, and they come, and, and, they, and, they, and, and, and this is reading between the lines, but they, they take the bride, and, and the parade starts, and they go all the way around the city, and, and everybody's holding up their lamps because they had enough oil, and, and people are singing and laughing, and, and then they go into the, where the wedding feast is, and the Bible is really interesting because it says they close the doors and lock them. These five come back, and as they get there, they realize they missed it all. They realize they've missed it all. And Jesus then throws in a statement that is absolutely bizarre. 